I don't know how to describe it other than like like a demon type of sound. But it's silhouetted, hulking, every bit of five and a half feet wide, 13 to 14 foot tall, pitch black. The one thing that ran through my mind when I had this encounter was I don't have a big enough gun. Your host, two-time witness and field researcher for more than 40 years, William Jevnik. Welcome to Creek Devil. Hello, everyone. I'm speaking with Gail today. Gail, how are you, my friend? I'm fine, Will. How are you? I'm good. And you've got someone else with you, correct? Yes, I do. I have my partner here, Debbie Ray. Hi, Debbie. Hi, Will. Hi, Will. How are you doing? I'm great. How are you this evening? Very good. Thanks for having us. Well, let's jump right into this. Uh, I'm going to let you two do most of the talking. And okay. Because that's what people like to hear. They don't like to hear me that much. So, <laughs> um, <laughs> Let's go ahead and start off by telling telling everyone how you got involved in the subject and maybe you know the first encounter just we'll just go from there okay okay um well actually my encounter happened in the late 60s up behind my house on Stissing Mountain in the town of Pine Plains New York I decided to do a little solo camping and um, I went up set up my tent got you know, settled in for the night, started to get dark, and about, I guess, around 8.30, I heard this loud owl, like an 800-pound owl, right above (laughs) me. Um, Yeah. It's a big owl. Yeah. And it was kind of unnerving, you know, because it didn't sound like a normal owl, but, you know, I just said, okay, Gail, just calm down, you know, nothing's going to bother you, you've been up here your whole life, and, you know, as a child playing up there, and, you know, I didn't ever have any fear, so a little, I don't know, a few minutes later, I had the most god-awful scream, yell, howl, like, unearthly sound so loud that it shook my chest. I I started shaking. I, I was like immobilized with fear, paralyzed or whatever you want to call it. And it just freaked me out. So I just sat there for I don't know how long. And I was thinking, well, if I sit here, whatever this is, is going to kill me. And so I had to, you know, make a decision, and I did, and I just bolted out of the tent, and it was up this steep ravine, so I slid down, you know, like cut myself up, and I made it back across the yard and into the house, and uh, my parents were sitting in the living room watching television, and they're like, what happened? Where were you? And I was all white and shaking and crying, and I said... I was up on the mountain, you know, because I I didn't tell you this part, but I did get grounded, so I was mad at my parents. So I said, I'm going up on the mountain camping, (laughs) and I didn't tell them. So then they were like, well, you shouldn't be up there alone, you know, and they said, what was it? And I said, I have no idea. I have never heard anything like it, and, you know, it, it was very traumatic, to say the least. Well, that was my first encounter. (laughs) Had you heard of any encounters around that area during that time? No, at that time, um, we didn't even ever, I never even heard of a Bigfoot. I never heard of the Patterson-Gimlin. It was only maybe a year um, after, or yeah, I guess around the same time that maybe that came out, 1967 or something like that. So I had never even heard of a Bigfoot or anything but I spent my childhood in the woods I was riding horses I was um, hunting fishing tracking you know I just grew up with nature and I was familiar with like all of the local animals but I had never even heard of a Bigfoot so it really blew my mind and I didn't know what it you know what it was until 2011 i think when finding bigfoot came on television and i heard that sound and that's how i figured out what this thing was <laughs> sure wow yeah yeah well what happened after that i mean what, what was your was there something else that happened after that or um well 
it wasn't, you know, I went about my life and I continued to hunt and fish and, and explore and always be outside with nature. And um, in 2011, when finding Bigfoot and hearing that sound, I got on my computer and Googled Bigfoot sightings in Dutchess County, which is the county I lived in. And the first sighting that came up was on Lake Road in Pine Plains, New York, which is where I lived. And I said, oh, my God. And this was a two um, women were driving and it was a daytime road crossing sighting of a large uh, black Sasquatch right down the road from our house. So that just sparked my curiosity, and I started reading everything I could get my hands on, going on YouTube, read your book, contacted you, I believe it was in 2011. Right. And helped me out with some important, you know, things that I didn't know. And ever since then, it's just uh, snowballed into, like, such a passion and meeting so many other people that have had similar experiences, it's just phenomenal. You've had a lot of stuff go on in your area. Do you want to talk about some of that? Oh, yeah. We've got stuff constantly, like reports coming in from people. I think I've got documented close to 300 reports. I'm starting a second book, which I did start already, and it'll be telling about, you know, my experiences, Debbie's, and um, the local encounters in the Hudson Valley. Um, For example, um, Debbie recently, what, about two or three weeks ago, Mm -hmm. found a 17-inch track right outside of her front door. Wow. You've got that, and then she also found a handprint and I'll let Debbie tell you a little bit because where she lives is is pertinent to um, you know why she's getting so much activity I believe okay uh, yeah I just I got out of my jeep and I opened the door and I looked down and there was a 17 inch footprint um, but I had had footprints in my backyard in the snow two years before and that's how I met Gail mm-hmm. uh, I had just broken my leg and I wasn't out there in, in this knee deep snow and um, my lawn guy was getting the snow off the roof and I was out there talking to him and I looked behind me and I went what the heck is that <laughs> it was coming right up from the pond near the railroad and just came right across my backyard kind of followed deer tracks mm-hmm. and uh, I measured them they were uh, what were 14. they 14 inch tracks and a 6 foot stride Yeah, mm-hmm. and they were 8 inches about 8 inches across and there was hair in uh, one of the hair in tracks. one of them and oh wow Gail came down a couple of days later and uh, videotaped, and she found a lot of little footprints down near the uh, tree line where they came out of. And then we were in the driveway, Mm -hmm. and it must have crossed the driveway and gone down the other side of the land in front of my driveway uh, into the brush because there were the tracks again, Mm -hmm. and uh, it was was incredible. So Gail and I kind of hooked up then. Uh, I didn't show any fear, so I guess you figured this one's good to take <laughs> off with her. So we just kind of clicked, and uh, we were both um, think alike on these things. Um, so the other day, I just yeah, I just saw that 17-inch one in my, right by my front door in the wood chips, mm-hmm. and I am not kidding you. It was two and a half to three inches deep. Yeah, it, that's a it, little unnerving by your front door. Oh yeah, oh yeah, it mm-hmm. had to take the big jump from the sidewalk over, and right. but it was just one footprint. I had a feeling it was telling me, "Don't worry, we're around," because mm-hmm. I'm kind of down the end of the street um, near the uh, the Hudson River by myself. So mm-hmm. well, I know they're out there. And then um, I was in the backyard with a friend, and he looked down in the dirt, and he he said, "What's that?" And there was this odd. I don't know if it's a handprint or claw prints, but mm-hmm. it's it's quite big and uh, about twice the size of a man's hand. So I went ahead and casted that. And so uh, I, I'm out there looking all the time. And I was just telling Gail, I put a trail camera up again tonight. Um, it didn't get anything much the other night, but I've got it on photos tonight. I'll see what if there's anything in this area where I we did go through a couple of years, two years ago down mm-hmm. there, mm-hmm. just to look around in the woods by uh, near the pond near the railroad, and um, 
something touched my hair, but we were just kind of looking around. There were some um, trees upside down, and uh, right, the root ball, the root was, ball was up, up in, the, in air. the air. Yeah, <laughs> and um, so I, I've learned a lot from Gail just hanging around her too. But it was kind of creepy there. So when we got back and looking at the videos, there was a dog man just yeah. leaning into the tree. Yeah, uh, it clear as day, clear yeah. as day. Uh, yeah. That just really creeped me out. That's so, creepy. Yeah. So I, I'm always on the lookout knowing there's there's something. There was something down there. There has to be still something there. I, I'd be really interested in seeing your handprint sometime. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. I can, we uh, can send you, I can the send you those, the pictures. Sure. Oh, I do. great. Awesome. Back vacation and yeah. I'm kind of playing catch up. I think they're on the Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley um, page, page yeah. Facebook page. Yep. Too. Yeah. It's fairly long. Did you measure it? Because it looks like claws, like on the end. Um, no, I didn't measure okay. it. I was so busy casting it fast yeah, that day because yeah. it was going to rain. Yeah. But No, uh, there's been a lot of... Um, we also, what, last week we were out blueberry picking. Oh, yeah. About not even a mile from my house. There's a beautiful farm with apples and peaches and blueberries. And so we had had some tracks a couple of years ago out there and so we debbie and i went out we brought the casting material debbie did and we brought the camera glasses and we're picking blueberries and squatching at the same time so um all of a sudden we hear this crack and snap and this we we were like oh my god did you hear that because we were in different rows and down in this wood line where we had gotten a picture, I think a year or two ago, of this gigantic-looking Sasquatch, mm -hmm. we saw, um, we went down there, and there was this live birch tree that they just snapped in half, and it was probably 14 feet in the air, you know, and yep. then they just snapped it, and the branches were fresh, the leaves were still on it. We knew, you know, it had to be a fresh break. So that was quite interesting. But um, we had just found some canine tracks about six inches long, stride about, I'd say at least six to seven feet in between the tracks. And I also videotaped that and that's on Bigfoot researchers on Facebook. But um, that's kind of creepy because, you know, we're getting more and more reports of these canine-type creatures. And two days ago, Debbie uh, saw on Facebook a local woman's horse was attacked. And the DEC for years has been saying there's no mountain lions here, which I've seen one. Uh, my kids have seen them. I know a lot of people that have seen the mountain lions. And now the DEC is claiming that it was a mountain lion attack. And I don't think it was. So, mm -hmm. you know, you're never going to get the truth out of them anyway. You sure. know. Yeah. Yeah. So we're, we're busy all the time. You know, we've been doing, um, well, we just wrote a children's book. And that's called A Young Researcher's Guide to Bigfoot. So we're, you know, working with the marketing reps and we're going to be traveling around um, promoting that. We've been doing um, different uh, presentations locally. We go to schools. We try to educate the children, um, the Girl Scouts, the camps and, you know, different kids, Boy Scouts, whoever wants. We don't charge them. And we bring our tracks and our boards with all our pictures and stuff trying to educate the public because there's a hefty population in New York. I, I I know most people think of New York as like the city, but we're not in the city. We are surrounded by farms and and mountains and the Catskills are right across the river. Hudson River's five minutes from my house and it's in Debbie's yard. Yeah. So it, it's amazing here. It really is. You know, it's funny, here in California, everybody thinks Los Angeles or San Francisco, but there's vast areas here oh. also. Oh, uh, it's, it's like that around the country. You know, people, they'll think of different regions and, and their minds sort of focus on the cities mm -hmm. without realizing that there are these huge tracts of wilderness areas. Mm -hmm. Exactly. 
It's incredible. yeah. They always associate it with the cities. You're right. Mm-hmm. When I when I'm in Boston, I say, "Oh, I'm from New York." They go, "Really? You came all the way up from the city?" I go, "Yeah, no. There's mm-hmm. a lot more to New York than, than the city." Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. Well, I know, I know you've you've actually now you had two pictures of Sasquatches that I actually have copies of them uh, from your what your Facebook page. Uh, mm-hmm. One was fairly close. It's it's more shadow. Do you want to talk about that one first? Oh goodness, I I have so many. I have over sixteen thousand pictures in my archives here. So, um, is it on our Facebook page? Because I just put a couple on tonight. I, I think this was actually a while ago. You had a while that ago. Okay. Yeah. Oh uh, God, will I have got so many? Um, you know, it's it's hard to. Keep Track. That's, that's okay. That's okay. I'll yeah. Just, I'll, like I said, I'll let I'll let you sort of take the mic and and talk about, you know, whatever you want to talk about. Okay. Um, well, I have an interesting story. Um, it's more of a dog man story. Is that okay? Or that's okay. Okay. Um, a gentleman had come into my bait shop uh, two years ago, and he saw some of my Bigfoot stuff, you know, whatever I have around the, the place. And he said, oh, my God, he said, if I got something to show you. So he gets out his cell phone, and he has this picture of this upright, uh, pointy, like, ears on the top, shaggy, long hair, standing on two legs. And it was in the woods, and it was hunting season, and he was in his tree stand with a muzzle loader. So he only had one shot in the gun. He saw these doe come running down the ridge erratically. So he said, "All right, you know, it's almost the end of the season." So he shot one. He dropped it. He got out of the tree. He went down to field dress it. He hears something behind him. He turns around and he sees this creature. And it was probably at least 100 yards from him. And it was starting to drizzle. And he was like, what in God's name is that? He had the mindset to get his phone out. He took one quick picture and he got out real quick. The next day he came back with his friends and his dog. And they started walking around the area. And not only was his doe laying there, but there was another doe laying right next to it with a broken neck and then they as they walked around the area farther his dog found a whole bunch of carcasses of you know one big buck neck broken legs ripped off a a few doe you know just a bone pile and he was like i have no idea what the heck this thing is why, you know, did it gift me with this other deer laying right next to it? You know, it was just the freakiest story. So I I just think that that's something that I, I can't even fathom, you know, what, what the heck is going on. You know, because this thing does not look like a Sasquatch. It's, like I said, pointy ears, long snout. Uh, black nose, like the. It, I'll have to send that one to you because it's just a mind blower. Okay. But um, yeah, there's just so many encounters. Like uh, people, this woman from um, Putnam County, which is about a little over an hour south of here, and she lives on a lake, rented a cabin with her family, and. Uh, Two o'clock in the morning, she's talking on the phone to her friend in Sweden, I believe. So she was, you know, on the phone and she was by the kitchen sink doing the dishes and chatting. And all of a sudden there's a space in the window and she's like, oh, my God, you know, and it was big and black. And, you know, she saw the eyes and everything, but it was just a quick you know, a couple of seconds and it was gone. Mm-hmm. So she started exploring and um, she found this perfect, like, teepee type structure, but not a real tall one, but, you know, like a teepee where something could crawl in it. So she called us and we went down to investigate. And sure enough, you know, there's this structure, not even maybe, maybe 500 yards, but up on a hill. And there were mountain laurels and, you know, branches that they had intertwined. And, uh, 
you know, so not even that far away from like people's houses, mm -hmm. like an actual community, you know, on a lake. But most of them are summer people. And we went there, I think it was like September or October when we went. But, you know, freshly made, like the mountain laurels were still green. And, you know, it was, it's like, it seems like they're coming closer and closer to homes churches um we've investigated a church in scotia new york which is north of here and um the man that's like the caretaker of the church was went out to the parking lot one night and he got this really you know bad growl like something aggressively was growling at him mm -hmm. so he's as a hunter and he um they have quite a bit of land it's an abandoned camp it used to be, you know, a camp, but now it's the buildings are still there, but nobody goes back there, just a few guys to hunt. And Debbie and I and uh, I think John, John went. Finn went yeah. with us and James, the, the caretaker, and we found a track. We found quite a bit of evidence after reviewing our footage. Um, you know, we caught a few peakers in there, and um, it, it's an amazing place. So we're planning a trip back there within the next few weeks. But it's swampy land and, you know, a lot of cover. And the fact that no one really goes back in there and there's a lot of deer, there's a pond, a creek. You know, they have the perfect habitat. But they're they're definitely coming closer to humans. I don't know what it is, but you know. Well, typically, you know, with Sasquatch is coming close to people. You know, we're kind mm -hmm. of a, we're kind of an easy mark when it comes to getting goodies. You know, food. We leave a lot of things laying around, and yeah. and even even pets. You know, I, mm -hmm. I know people don't might not like, not like to hear that, but it's it's true. They will take animals. So. Oh yeah. Um, we're an easy mark, so I mean, <laughs> you're going to go yeah. where food's easy. Well, yeah, that reminds me. When was it? February. Okay, James? We, yeah. yeah. Oh, no, the guy on um, Route 9. We got a call from a manager of a local... Um, oh, food, uh, fast food. Fast food store in the busiest place, Will, that, you know, I mean, I, was it 9 or 9? Route, Route 9, which you would know, but... <laughs> It's like a city, mm -hmm. and uh, the man went out to empty the garbage around midnight into the dumpster, and he heard something around the backside of the dumpster, and he had his cell phone out with his light on. He put that on, went in the back. There is a Bigfoot. And it was female. And it was a female, mm -hmm. and, it you know, he saw it, it saw him, and they both took off, and he... <laughs> was so upset he's like i'm never taking the garbage out again <laughs> <laughs> that's yeah. a, you know that's actually very common uh that's something i've looked into i mean many years ago started hearing uh -huh. about them picking through garbage uh yeah. when i had my second sighting mm -hmm. that i was looking in an area that people were would go up on the washugo river this is in skamania county or, or on the border of skamania county in southern mm -hmm. washington and People would go up there on the weekends and they'd leave a lot of trash around. It actually had little a little dumps, and these things would come in during the week when nobody was up there and pick through the garbage. And then I wow. found out that was actually very common behavior. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, it's crazy. Especially, like, this is such a... I mean, there's cars going up and down the road. It's crazy. Yeah. But it was midnight, so I guess, you know, it was dark and the Sasquatch was hungry for ice cream or uh, <laughs> French fries or something. Sure. <laughs> yeah, let's say there might have been a couple of blizzards in that trash can. Right, right. <laughs> oh, well, there you go, see. <laughs> yeah. It wasn't a happy meal. <laughs> yeah, right. Ay, ay, ay. You know, there's, it's just so crazy. And then where I live, I live on, uh, it's called the Sawk Hill Creek, and it's a tributary to the Hudson. And so, I, I don't know, I probably told you this, but maybe not. A couple of years ago, I was bass fishing up the creek with a friend of mine, Jesse. And I said, Jesse, let's um, get off on shore up here, because we own... A little piece of property up there and I always thought it would be nice to put a little cabin up there or something mm -hmm. so he's like okay so we pull over to the shore and I see this snapped off branch as soon as we pull up to the shore so I'm like hmm it's about four inches in diameter 
Then I get out of the boat and I see the head of a carp because we have huge carp in here. So I said, well, maybe the otters because we do have a family of otters. So I didn't think too much of it. So I start crawling in through this little trail and uh, I tripped and I look up and I see this dome shaped nest made out of uh, like grape vines and, you know, not big, thick branches like the other ones we found, but just like twine branches in a dome, almost like an igloo. And it's got a stick in the front where the entrance would be. And I was like, oh, my goodness, Jesse, I said, we just found a nest. And I know a beaver can't make anything like that because we have beaver on the pond and they make their own, you know, beaver dens and, and they chew off the sticks and everything. This was totally different. So I said, OK, Jesse, I think we better get the heck out of here. And that before that, I didn't really know that they were here on the property. But since then, I had a sighting one night in February um, of two creatures across our creek. There's like a tree line and then a, like a knoll and then a big farmer's field where they grow crops and everything. And it, it was covered with snow at the time. And I was out on the porch with my cat. And it was 9.30 at night. And I looked across and I see two sets of almost like they were green eye shine, but almost like LED lights. That's how bright they were. So I was like, what the hell? So I yelled across the pond. I'm like, who's over there? Immediately, psh, gone. And that's when I knew, you know, they're they're here. Sure. So, yeah, they're, they're always here watching. And, you know, they haven't harmed my animals. They haven't, you know, they've scared us a few times, but... They throw rocks at the fishermen at times, and um, last two, three weeks ago, we had some fellas here that we met, and um, they're yoga instructors, mm -hmm. and they're into the Bigfoot. So we had them here for dinner, and uh, we said, you know, I was showing them around the property. They had been here the year before, but it poured rain that day. So we were just standing on the shore, um, and... So we, uh, they started making this um, breathing sounds that they do during their yoga. yoga meditation or whatever the heck. And they sounded like, uh, uh, yeah. you know, aggressive. And these are, you know, three big guys. Sure. And they had children with them, a couple of little boys and a nice woman. All of a sudden, how it didn't take too long. No. The Bigfoots across the pond started wood knocking. Yeah. They were like, whack. And everybody's like, did you hear it? What was that, Gail? I said, there's nothing over there. It's a field. There's nobody over there. And they did it about six or seven different times. Mm -hmm. And we were videotaping at the time, so um, we got it on tape. But that was exciting. And they were, like, thrilled. They're like, oh, my God, this place is so squatchy. <laughs> <laughs> but, yeah, it's it's just, I don't know. It's You have to change your your whole way of thinking when you know that they're on your property mm -hmm. and they're watching you. Like both Debbie and I, you know, have had to learn to live with it. And luckily they haven't harmed us, you know. I don't think they will. I, I you know, I, 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 I'm, we're just at the point now where, where we realize they're all over the place. You right. just have mm -hmm. to open your mind and open your eyes yeah. and listen. You know, you go out and, just listen. I know Wayne Wilson down in North Carolina said the other day, just go out and talk to them. They'll show themselves. <laughs> he's such a character. He's um, got him, too. He's got him down there, too. And, you know, he's like, oh, yeah, hi over there. You know, <laughs> He's so cool about it. But he said, just get out there and talk to them. Yeah, he, he doesn't have the fear factor. No. You know, no. I haven't gotten over that yet. You know, I, 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 I think... I think it's probably healthy not to get over that, actually. Right. Yeah. Yeah, I think so, too. You never know if one's going to be a rogue, rogue you yeah. know, or a mother protecting a baby. Oh, yeah. I mean, who knows? Yeah. You know? No, they will. Like, Connie, um, Connie Emmy is a team member of ours, and she just moved to Kentucky. Um, and uh, 
she and Brian, this other uh, fella that I had taken out with us for the first time, <laughs> and wouldn't you know, they had the encounter that scared the heck out of them. Um, it was a mother Sasquatch, and I have the video and the um, photographs, the stills from the video, and she had a juvenile on her left shoulder, clinging to her left shoulder, and a an infant and then a juvenile in front of her and he had a stick in his hand and the mother had a stick mm -hmm. and Connie and Brian I was on a lower trail and Connie and Brian were on the higher trail and um, we were supposed to meet up and so I didn't hear from them and I'm like geez you know I better text them and see what the heck's going on they should have met us by now well, evidently, they stopped to get a drink of water. Connie put her camera down. You know, Brian, they put their backpacks down. And all of a sudden, this thing started whack, whack, whacking the trees and the brush. And it scared them so bad. And then I texted and I said, where are you? And she said, well, well where are you? Was that you making that horrible noises? And I'm like, no. I would never do that. And so she, they just grabbed their water and then grabbed their backpack and ran. And then when we reviewed the video, there's the mother and the, the two young. So she was protecting her young. And they had smelled something right before that, too. Like they said, oh, that smells horrible. What is it, a dead animal? And they said, yeah, it's probably just a dead carcass, a rotting carcass. But it wasn't. <laughs> So that was pretty scary. Brian's like, this is sure this happens to me the first time I go out squatching. <laughs> be, be, careful, be careful what you wish for. Oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Do you yeah. have any experience with um, uh, them smelling a lot? Because we don't get that very Too often. Too often, no. No. You know, uh, you know, I talked to Renee Hinden about that years ago, and, and uh -huh. his comment to me was, you know, he says, everybody likes to focus on things like that, but in reality... Mm -hmm. Of all the reports he and John Green collected, he said maybe one out of ten. Right. And, yeah. and And my thoughts are it's probably like other other primates. For instance, gorillas have scent glands, and when they mm -hmm. get excited, mm -hmm. they, you know, they right. emit this odor. So it's probably yeah. something like that. Yeah, that's what I think too. Yeah. yeah. I've only smelled it, I think, two times. Like we spooked a, a bunch of them out of an area mm -hmm. and, you know, just must have come up on them too quick. And they they just let out that, but only a couple of times. Yeah. I've only smelled it once myself. Yeah. yeah. Most of the time they're so stealthy, as you know, Will, you could yeah. be like within feet of them. Oh, yes. And not even know they're there nothing moves nothing you know you don't hear anything but when they want you to know and they want to get you out of there they let you know oh yes they do oh, god and i find at night um that's when i've had the scariest things happen and um the one night of december 31st 2013 13. or 4 or 13 okay I went out with some guys from Massachusetts. I, I had been researching this habituation site where the guys had him on his roof, on his porch. Uh, looking throwing, in his windows. Yeah, looking <laughs> in his windows, scratching at his screens. His wife left him and took the children. That's how bad it got. She couldn't sleep. I mean, you know, it was terrible. So um, we decided to go out. We brought these guys because they had a FLIR camera. And they said, oh, we got a FLIR. And I said, oh, great, you know. So we went out during when it was still light, and I, you know, showed them the lay of the land and everything. And so we came in the house, sat down to have a bite to eat, and the one guy jumped up out of the chair. One walked by in front of the window, and he's like, did you see that? And I just caught a glimpse of a shadow. So I said, oh, well, I told you they're here. So then we got ready, we geared up. I went out first. Those guys were still gearing up. As soon as I walked out onto his porch, I heard this big snap and splash into the creek. So I said, all right, guys, come on, let's go. So we go down, and it's maybe 100 yards from his porch, and there's a fence in a creek. And this is where they're always there. They're always doing something, wood knocking or whatever. 
So uh, the one guy gets the FLIR camera, and he and I are together, and then the homeowner and the other gentleman were, you know, kind of teaming up. So they started walking straight towards the, the creek, and the other guy and I were focused to the right where the tree was pushed down. All of a sudden, he's like, I made contact, contact. So he's filming them. They start getting violent, and they broke down trees, Will, that were, I'd say, 18 inches around, like live trees, but it was in December. It was freezing cold. They just started breaking these trees. I have all the pictures and, you know, everything. And he got five of them on the FLIR that night. And so finally, you know, I said, come on, guys. Now they're really pissed off. Let's get back to the house. We did. We were safe. They didn't, you know, they could have jumped over this little rickety fence and ripped our heads off with no trouble at all. And, uh, I mean, the one guy, he got physically ill. They must have zapped him. He started, like, almost vomiting, you know, wrenching. Um, he got dizzy. He was not, you know, he was really sick for at least a half an hour. We got him inside, but, oh, my God, what? That was really frightening. That was like, the, except for the first night when I was alone, that was the scariest thing that I've ever lived through. And I don't wish to do that again. But you know, I think I, it, go, I, at I, night... I, I, I always tell people they shouldn't really shouldn't go out at night no. because these guys no. are hunt they're hunting and foraging that's, at night and you really don't want to interrupt that. No, right. that's exactly what I I mean. Very rarely do I go out at night. Now Les Stroud's here in New York, um, in the next town over, and Debbie and I are going to take him out this week. So I said I will make one exception. And that's for less, because if he can't, you know, he's doing a seminar, and if he can't come out with us during the day, then I will take him to this hot spot at night. But that's the only, you know, I'm making an exception for him because I don't go out at night anymore, really. You yeah, know, it's, it, it's definitely something I don't recommend. No, yeah. no. That's when they want to hunt or breed or, you know, let their little ones roam around and, you know, have their freedom. And they do not like it. We're lucky. Yeah, we are lucky. Because really, God, that was scary. Yeah, all our sightings have been in the daytime anyway. So right. who needs to be out at 2 o'clock in the morning? Right. <laughs> That's right. This is true. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. But, but actually, Debbie just bought a night vision yeah. FLIR, so we kind of want to. <laughs> but really, all we have to do is walk down to the creek right here in yeah. my own yard. Yeah. And uh, we'll probably catch something up, you know, eye shine at least, if not something more. Yep, we'll get something. Yeah. We'll get something on it. We just need a night to do it. Yes, definitely. You wanna do you want to mention your Facebook page so people can go and take a look at pictures? Oh, yeah. It's called Bigfoot Researchers of the Hudson Valley on Facebook. And now we just have a new um, website called BigfootResearcher.com. And, and then our book is available for purchase on that and Amazon, A Young Researcher's Guide to Bigfoot. And then we are also on YouTube under Hudson Valley Squatch One. So there's quite a bit of stuff out there. It's uh, it's opened just a whole new lifestyle for me and Debbie too. Yeah. And all of us and meeting some of the greatest people. I just am so thrilled to know people from all over the world, not just in the United States. Mm -hmm. But, you know, every one of us is so passionate about the subject that I feel kind of blessed to have fallen into it. Yeah. <laughs> it, it could certainly be life-changing, that's, that's for sure. Oh, yeah. Oh, it truly is. It, it, but it's also good to meet and talk to people across the country. What are your experiences? Look at their pictures. Um, you know, and compare things and or ask some questions. How do you do this? What do you find when you do that? Right. And it would, it would just be great to get a, a group together and just talk about your experiences and, and how you research. And is it different on the West Coast than what we do on the East Coast? And 
to share ideas. It's uh, in, in a friendly forum. It right. would just be, it would be so good. Well, do you think, Will, that um, I know in Texas and maybe in Kentucky and some of the other states seem to have more aggressive encounters than we do here in New York? Yes, yeah, certainly. And, and I, I know you've probably talked to Jeremiah Fountain. Um, mm-hmm. You know, of yeah. course, it's a little farther north from you, I believe. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he's in the... Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, he knows right. where we... One of the things in that part of the country, we kind of predominantly have the type fours, and, and I'm working on a book about the different types. Good. Uh, so that, that'll that'll help clear up a lot of things for people. But when you look at the other types, now the type fours aren't necessarily as aggressive. We don't really see that with that particular uh, variation of the creatures. <laughs> but the type the type ones are what we think of when we see the Patterson film. Okay. Then we look at the type twos and threes. Now the threes, I I mean I I don't really know what to think about. I know what my anthropologist friends <laughs> tell me about, you know the dog man, but mm-hmm. uh, I I don't really know what to think myself about that. I'm sort of leaving that on the shelf somewhere. I deal strictly with Sasquatches, but uh, the type three, I think sometimes is mistaken for that because it has that elongated face. It's more of a simian face than the flat face that the other regular Sasquatches mm-hmm. have. But that one and the type two seem to be much more aggressive than the other types, and yeah. and and that's relatively common, actually. Hmm. Yeah, I I don't know. I mean, we've been lucky, like I said, any one of the hundreds of times of being out there in such close proximity to them, they could have just tore us apart. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, why they haven't, I don't know, and especially that night you know, with the FLIR, because I think they know, I know that they know what a camera is, but for some reason that FLIR set them off, you know, like they know that we could see them and we got the heat signatures on them and that really bent them out of shape. And the man, the homeowner told me the next night, it was New Year's Eve, he had his girlfriend over I guess they didn't go out, or they went out to dinner, came home, looked around his yard, and he said, and I I didn't believe him at the time, I thought he was exaggerating, but he said that there were 30 sets of eye shine around the perimeter of his property, like some of them, most of them low to the ground, almost like they were belly crawling, and he said they were, most of them were green, but some had the red eye shine, that girlfriend got so scared, she ran in the house. He went in, locked the door, got his shotgun. He said they were retaliating for the night before because of what we had done. You know, come in with strangers with that FLIR camera. So uh, the girl wouldn't come back to his house. She's never been back there again. And believe me, that place is creepy. Oh, I, I, it, they do have some, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, no, go ahead. I was just going to say they do have a, lot, a very vindictive behavior. Yeah. Oh, I believe it. I, You know, what else he told me is he would go to visit relatives in the city, but he had started feeding them. Um, every single afternoon he would make like a dozen peanut butter and jelly sandwiches. He'd buy honey buns. He'd buy like all kinds of treats and candies and put them out like in Ziploc bags. Sometimes he would hook them on nails on the fence line. And so, you know, they were taking them. Then we would go into the woods. We would find the bags, the Ziploc bags, um, sliced like almost like someone took a razor blade and sliced them open, not pecked open or chewed like a, a you know woodchuck or a bird or anything would do. And so he would collect the bags and show them to me. And I'm like, oh, well, this is weird. It's like they had a sharp nail and they would just cut along the side of the bag. So then when he would have to go to visit his relatives or if he had a funeral or something and he'd have to leave for a few days, when he came back is when they would get really angry and they would start, you know, howling or scratching or banging on the side of his house, throwing rocks, moved his furniture from his porch, like, you know, just took his chairs and randomly, you know, moved them, um, 
take, he kept a chair in a fire pit down by the creek. They flipped the chair over. You know, they were just like mad that he didn't feed them every day. So that's why I suggest that people do not feed them, and especially when, that close. When when you talk to people from the south, if they well, they'll actually talk to you about, you know, what they know in that part of the country. Yeah. They say it's very strictly forbidden. You know, among many people there, not to feed them for that exact reason, they can become very violent. Right. Um, I, I'll give you an example. You know, I've got a, a friend who's a cop in the Southwest, and one of his friends. You know, th- without going through the whole story, mm-hmm. uh, this thing was taking you know food items from around his ranch, and you know things he had put out, not for the creatures, but you know food items he had, you know, for his for his animals. And then was gone for about a month, and so the food wasn't available. Mm-hmm. Uh, this thing actually got into his house. He was oh, napping, and it was standing over him. And he woke up, it pounced oh. on him, oh. threw him around the house like a rag doll, and in the course of the fight, bit off one of his fingers, oh. Oh. Uh, knocked him out by throwing him into a wall, and then proceeded to trash his house. So, God, you know, it's it's a good yeah. thing really not to feed them. I know some right. people like to do that, but I, I really would not do that. Right. Oh, my God. That's scary. That's terrifying. Yeah. I mean, think about it, Will. Any time they want, they can get into any one of our homes. You know, my door, they could push it down with the, probably two fingers, you know, or break through a window if they want. God. Oh, sure. Right. Frightening. That's frightening. Yeah. Well, that's a good reason not to feed them. Absolutely. Whizzikers. Yeah. Yeah, and and then when they do take the uh, domestic animals, I was listening to a show where the um, man had, like, coon hounds or, you know, some kind of hunting dogs that he raised and he chained them all up, Um, you know, and I guess they had a little dog house and they chained them up and and they they killed, I don't know how many of his dogs, like his prize-winning dogs. Just, you know, ripped them to shreds, ripped their heads. I mean, yeah. God in heaven, you know, I, aggressive. I, yeah, yes. I, I interviewed a guy in the southeast. Um, I believe he's, I think he was in Florida at the time. But I, th- I think at the time when he was doing his investigations was in one of the Carolinas. And, mm-hmm. and he talked about a number of incidents in this one particular town. And I, I'm sorry, I can't remember the exact place off the top of my head, but uh, mm. This creature was doing for whatever perceived slight. Uh, mm. It was killing, you know, domestic uh, uh, livestock. Yeah. And, and it wasn't eating them. It wasn't doing anything except vindictively killing them and leaving killing. them like it was a message to the people in that area. Uh, mm. Again, we don't know why, but it was it was very gruesome the, the way it was killing these animals. Wow. I, I just, I can't even imagine. I mean, gee whiz, you know, you're so attached to your pets and, and then to go out and find them just slaughtered like that. Yeah, it'd be well, pretty awful. Let, yeah. We got a report last year. This uh, kid that comes to the bait shop was working for a farmer north of here about 20 miles. And he called me up and he's like, Gail, I went to work today. He said... The full-grown bull had its neck broken and one of its legs pulled out and thrown 15 feet from the carcass. The farmer said, what the heck, you know, could have done this? He's, you know, trying to think of bear, mountain lion, whatever. I said, let me, you know, talk to the guy. We'll come up and do an investigation. He wouldn't have any part of it because he had like a farm stand where people would come and purchase, you know, vegetables and oh, eggs. And, sure. And he did not want the word to get out about it. So we're we're running into that quite a bit. Even like the lady with the horse, Debbie had sent her a message, said, look, you know, we'll come out. Uh, we won't tell anybody. You know, we'll be very discreet. We'll bring trail cameras and we'll set them up and we'll just do an investigation. And we never heard back from her. So I think that, you know, a lot, you know yourself, a lot of people, especially the old timers, they don't want to talk about this. 
They don't want people, to, you know, any attention drawn to them, their property or their farms or whatever. And it's frustrating. Definitely. Hey, I'll tell you, it's interesting. You know, I, I've run across that so many times over the years. And I was, mm-hmm. uh, I, I've been telling a few people I know, I, I'm the current book I'm working on, I've got a picture that was sent to me a while back. Uh, and it's it's not a blob squatch. It's a very clear midday photograph of a Sasquatch, and it's actually running away from the person who took the Mm -hmm. picture. But it's not a very distant picture. It's fairly close. Mm -hmm. Good good detail. Uh, Unfortunately, it is from the back, but it's it's very detailed uh, from Mm -hmm. that perspective. Uh, The person who sent it to me, the photograph was given to her by the people who took it, the family. Uh, Mm -hmm. They refuse to absolutely talk about it. They won't acknowledge it. They even deny what's in the picture. Really, yeah. oh, and but it's it's probably I, in terms of quality, it's probably every every bit as good as the Patterson film. It's just a wow. still photograph, but it's that good a picture. Wow, wow. Uh, it's amazing. You know, I mean, there's so many people like in in Kentucky, West Virginia. We I had traveled down to visit Connie uh, last September in Wingo, Kentucky. <laughs> and um, so my son drove me down and we were, you know, I did some squatching, went to land between the lakes, went to some different uh, Daniel Boone State Forest and all over the place. And um, we were heading back home and we stopped at a convenience store and I had my necklace that Debbie had given me with the Bigfoot on it, right? Mm-hmm. So this uh, nice girl at the, behind the counter, she said, is that a Bigfoot? And I said, yeah. Yeah, you know, I have a group from New York and, you know, started chatting and she said, oh, my God, you have to come to my mother's house. And I said, oh, she only lives, uh, you know, not too far away. She's got them buggers or whatever the heck she called them. And she started telling me all these stories of, you know, for years that this is going on. And it's like, wow, you know, I wish I could spend more time interviewing people from that area, West Virginia. Um, You know, it just seems like there's so much more happening there, maybe because of the cave systems. I don't know. It's crazy. Well, the the Appalachian Trail, too. Yes. Oh, Uh, yeah. It brings that, you know, has a lot of activity down there. Oh, yeah. So, uh, I think... People see more down there. Yeah. Well, listen, and they're rural, too. Yeah. 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 Well, listen, we're running a little short on time. So okay. uh, any final thoughts before we wrap it up? Um, well, I'm just looking forward to, you know, bringing more stuff to light. You know, less is, like I said, coming. And we're hoping to have a good adventure with him. Mm-hmm. And uh, we're going to share everything that we find. We we believe in sharing what we find. So, yeah. you know, that's our goal this year is just to keep busy and stay healthy and get some good squatching on. Yeah. <laughs> We just keep investigating. Yeah. All right. Well, listen, Gail and Debbie, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you, Will, and congratulations on your new show and your new book. Oh, thank you so much. I actually have three three new ones in the works. So three. I have <laughs> two here, but I, not, I'm, for those listening, I'm. Oh, I'm sorry. What was that? I said I have two of your books, but I will get the new ones oh, well, too. Oh, I, I need to send you all of them then. You're actually mm-hmm. in. You're actually in. I want a photograph of you casting a track is in uh, Bigfoot Fieldwork 101. Oh, cool! All right. Well, and, we'll and, send the bar book then. Yeah, yeah. We'll send right. you. Our- uh, yes. Absolutely. I'll send you guys each. Uh, you know, book. So. Nice. Thank you. Thank well, listen, you. I, I know you mentioned just coming back from vacation. So for those listening, I'm actually going to be on vacation. I'm leaving tomorrow for New Mexico. So. Um, I'm not sure how the schedule is going to work out. I'm going to be doing some interviewing while I'm there, so I'm hoping to have something a little bit special for everyone the following week. So uh, let's I'll keep my fingers crossed and hope that I get what I want. So <laughs> good, I hope so. I'll say a prayer for you. Okay. Well, thank you so much, and you two have a good evening. Okay. Thank you for having. Thank us. you, Will. Good night. Good night. 
Thanks for listening to this episode of Creek Devil. If you or anyone you know has had an encounter with these creatures, please contact us at williamjevning at yahoo.com. That's William, J-E-V-N-I-N-G, at yahoo.com. All communication is confidential. Join us for another program next week. And until then, keep your eyes open now.